he said, dude, you have no idea. He said, this thing's gonna sell millions. He said, this is gonna be huge. He wasn't playing the game, you know what I right. mean? He wasn't copying what was on the radio at the time. He was coming out as himself and making a bold statement. Welcome back to Dead Wax. We are here today with one of my favorite producers of all time, John Alasia. This is John Alasia. He's a record producer, engineer, and mixer who's worked with artists such as John Mayer, Dave Matthews Band, Jason Mraz, and so many more. Listening to a song that he produced by John Mayer called No Such Thing. Here we go. Let's dive right in and take a listen. I want to run through the halls in my high school. I want to scream at the top of my Man, I haven't listened to that song, like sat there and listened to it for so long. I haven't either. When was the last time you sat down and listened to this song? I mean, it probably was 2000. Oh my God. Three, two, I mean, I, I don't really know. But, yeah. You know, it yeah. holds up. It does. It holds up it's so well. It's a good well. song. It's, the core is so good. The composition is so good. And his voice is so good. His performance is great. Yeah, John rolled in with that thing, I mean, that whole record, there, you didn't have to mess with the, the compositions whatsoever because he just was, he had it. So he came to you with those songs finished? Fully flushed out. How did you we guys meet? You. We met through a friend, um, a woman named Courtney Hard, who was an intern at ASCAP in, okay. in, um, in New York City. This is like 1999. And Courtney, it was her very first day, she had a little CD of John Mayer and she wanted to hand it off to me because she said John would play on anything that I was working on. And I was working with a couple bands at the time. Like as a guitar player? As a guitar player. He was trying and to get he like was trying to, session guitar He was, wanted to be a session <laughs> guitar player. And I heard this song, so I was like, this dude is way more than just a guitar player. Yeah. The, the, the song craft was remarkable. Yeah. So John and I started this, this friendship over the phone. It was like a six month, like a, and had he heard stuff that you'd worked on? Yeah, before? He'd, he'd, known, he'd known a lot of the stuff I'd worked on with Dave Matthews, and he was always a big Dave Matthews fan. Um, so he didn't have a deal at this point. No, no. So, and did you produce, did you produce this record before he had a deal? Yeah, but and, and, and the whole story of the deal is remarkable. But uh, Greg Latterman ended up signing him to Aware Records. I'm not sure if you remember Aware, but Aware. Greg also signed uh, Train. So John, John knew your stuff with Dave. Yeah. And what else? Okay. Do you and, know and, and other records that you did? He heard, heard uh, some Vertical Rise and stuff I've worked on. And I knew, hear that in there for sure, yeah. And he knew I was friends with uh, Ben Folds. And, mm. and he he just loved all those bands and, and a couple others. But, you know, I, I'd always been recording guitars. I'd, I'd done, like, I was kind of practicing to make this kind of record yeah. um, for, for a decade because I was with a buddy, Doug Derryberry, and we made three records, and we were just two guys playing acoustic guitars, but we we were always making music with acoustic guitar players. And um, John Mayer comes along, and I'm thinking to myself, I mean, the composition's really fantastic. And I thought, you know, maybe he'll sell a couple hundred thousand records. And I think he thought the same thing, because when he got that Grammy, he said, this moment is kicking my ass. Did yeah. you hear John's, the EP that he did by himself, the yes. acoustic one? Is yeah. that the thing, that's the CD that she gave you? That's the that first was, thing you heard? I, I heard some of that, but I also heard a bunch of his own demos. And the demos were remarkable as well. I mean, yeah. John, John would play everything on them and, and they just, you know, when you, when you get those demos for the first time, they're so innocent and there's just there's yes. something very enticing about them. And, and you almost like, I, mean, I think everyone should release their early demos, you know? Yeah. I want to ask you what you heard, because it sounds like you heard this demo and you're like, these are smart songs. These are, he's not just a session guitar player, he's a composer and a songwriter. What is it that you heard about this song, say, that you still hear when we listen back to it 20 years later? What is yeah. it that you think makes this composition, uh, you know, stand out? I think that there's such a fresh quality about the, just the content of it and also just the, 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 the rebellion, you know, of, of, and, and it, it, there was this juxtaposition, juxtaposition of like rebellion and also like these sweet, you know, major seven chords and, and just the way he told the story. I mean, it was just really, I mean, it was, it was a great pairing. I mean, to, to have those two things in, in one song and also getting to know John and his personality. I saw him when I first met him in person, I got to see him down at Eddie's Attic with David Brian Harris. Mm -hmm. And I watched those two light up a room and I, I, I just thought, okay, this is incredibly special. You saw that before you did the record. Yeah. And yeah. I, and I, and yeah. I heard him do, I heard, I heard John by himself. I heard John with David Ryan Harris. And I thought, just don't fuck this up. You know, <laughs> just, 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 just kind of stay out of the way. I mean, I, I, I hired a drummer for the record and, and then. Who was the drummer? Uh, Near Z. Okay. I met him through my friend, Pete Robinson. And then we did the, re the record down in Loho, um, 
studios in uh, Lower Manhattan, and then took the rest of the record and finished it at my house on the Eastern Shore. How long were those sessions? Um, we spent 12 days on the basics, and then we went to my house and spent maybe, I don't know, three weeks on all the overdubs. And, and the basics stuff. were, was John playing acoustic yeah. for that? And acoustic and electric and, and yeah, it was just bass drums and, and, uh, and guitar and John's rough vocal. Okay, and, and then did we, you and use then, any of those? I mean, I, I would cut up the bass and drums and then we would recut all the guitars. When you mean cut up the bass and drums, you mean like you'd say, no, we're not gonna use bass from the chorus, that wasn't good, we're gonna take bass from yeah. this chorus and that section. Yeah, okay. just, you just, comp just, just comp the You're just, just like comping. comping. And everything's yeah. to click? Yes. The whole record? Yes. Yeah. And, and John was totally for it. I mean, it's just easier for editing. I mean, when John was tracking, was he playing acoustic and singing at the same time, or was he just tracking acoustic? He was he was doing electric the whole time, just so he could be in the room and there be not there, there wouldn't be any bleed. So at like fifty eight and electric yeah. with an isolated amp and yep. headphones. So yep. really, what you're getting is the bass and drums, and then yep. John's going to overdub acoustics, yeah. and you're going to space them out and pan them left mm -hmm. and right. Okay, so John is just giving them something to react to, right. so that they play exactly the composition fully and articulated. Can yes. I ask about about this keyboard part that kind of goes throughout the entire song. Yeah. So the good boys and girls take the so is that you? Who is that? That is John Mayer. That's him playing that? He, you he, talking about like this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. John what, had, what John had just purchased this, uh, the, the, the Korg Triton 3, I believe is what it was called. Oh my God. And he was obsessed with that whole thing. We were also like listening to old Michael Jackson records all the time because like, you know, all, all the keys on those records were just amazing. Yeah. But John would always have his hands on, on that track. That's so funny. I feel like that's very of the moment. If yeah. you cut that song again now, that keyboard would not be in it. Yeah. You know probably, what I mean? Like, probably not. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> It'd be some like OP1. You know yeah. what I mean? It'd yeah. be whatever yeah. new toy. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's so, that's so iconic. Yeah, that's... it's got a little bit of portamento on it. Yeah. So it swoops between notes. And it's yeah. also the note choices that it's playing is interesting. If you mm -hmm. play, yeah. like it's always, it's on, you know, it's on the sussy notes. It's on yes. the four and the six. So the good boys and girls take the... Yeah. 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 And yeah. The chord is... Yeah. 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 So that was his, that's his part. That's his part. Okay. And wait, just to be clear, what's, what's, I think what's really cool about that yeah. part, right, is the chord is this major seven with the three. Right. Yeah. And he's playing. Yeah. On top of that. Yeah. And it gives you this magical thing with the four, three, which I love. Sometimes when I'm yeah. voicing a major chord, I'll put the four in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Just because I like the way that kind of breaks up and sounds it suspension gets, yeah, yeah. It, it feels just more mystical and right. that this like verse it sounds like a fairy tale to me it's that four sus thing with the three that makes it feel like the fairy tale lyric you know busting down the double doors and it's this like futuristic kind of thing yeah and then he also adds in the second second verse the e or, or the d flat or d sharp c sharp wah, wah, wah. All of our parents, they're getting older. Wah, right wah, wah. oh oh yeah, and then yes. he puts those those big carpenter esque layered vocals in. Uh, yes, you know. on the on the yeah. yeah. Oh, that is a, it's an E minor. Yeah, E minor. Oh, it's so thick and lush. Can we just talk beautiful. about harmony for a second? Because yeah. yes, please. This was fresh. I mean, I hadn't really heard like this hit me exactly exactly at the right point in my life. I was like <laughs> maybe seventh grade or eighth grade when this came out, and I loved Stevie Ray Vaughan, yeah. and I was learning about jazz, and so when I heard this, I got really upset because I was like. Fuck, this guy already did it. He, this guy <laughs> beat me to the punch. He did Stevie Ray Vaughan friggin' guitar solos over well-crafted pop songs with interesting harmony. That was yeah. that was really fresh to me to hear like these are all very guitar-y chords, you yeah. know? And then yeah. and like, yeah. like all this, all these chords are so guitar-y. I and love was, that moment when he goes to the A major and then down to that F. Right. Because yes. it's like he's modulating to the four for a second. So you feel like that's a flat six. It sounds mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like a flat two in right. the context of the exactly. bridge. Exactly. It feels like a flat six. Exactly. And that feels like one. Totally. But actually that's the four of the key of the song right. that we're in. It was a really interesting pivot moment. Yeah. yeah. 
And, and then it, it introduces that F chord in a way that's just super surprising because it's totally out of the key, right? Yeah, and, and then coming out of the bridge, yeah. it goes to like another bridge, right. an instrumental, which, you, which goes back to this chord, yeah. which again, feels like one, mm -hmm. but we need that section to get back to the E. e. Right. Yeah. So play coming out of the bridge. Okay. I want to hear that A major. Here we go. G, yeah. So that feels like one. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. And then let's hear how we get back to... I think it's the F sharp. Yeah. Right? Two dominant. A, yeah. Now, wait a minute. There's another interesting thing about that F, that two dominant. It's a, it's a six and a seven at the same time. Right. And Which is the same thing as that four three. There might also be a four three at the same time. It's so yeah. clustery. It's very clustery. But that that's it's just it adds so much. Like there are some it's artists. A lot of color. There is some artists who, whose harmonic sense is part of their voice as an artist. John is one of those artists, mm -hmm. right? When you hear those harmonies, you, it just feels like John Mayer. That's right, what John yeah. Mayer would play. And, and there's, it's a rare artist whose harmonic sense is the, the, the signal of, of you know, who they are. And I feel like he, he claimed all of these voicings. Yeah. Like he really, he really like put his stamp on the guitar, like all these voicings that are so yeah. guitar-y. Mm -hmm. Like that's... That's his sound. Like he somehow just copyrighted all of that. So, what was your approach then? You got these songs. I'm sure some of these some of these moments existed. Some of them different. Some of them didn't. But what was the production approach that you took that, that you took to the record? How did you decide? Like, how are we even going to do this? Are we going to track live? How did you make those decisions? I mean, it was very budgetary. We had very we had a really small budget, and we had to be really efficient. So I found a studio down in Lower Manhattan that was very affordable. I was living in New York at the time and John would stay with me. Like everyone was in New York, New Year's Eve was there. So, and Dave, Dave Labriere would fly out from Atlanta. So it, it was all very affordable. We went in and wanted to knock out as much as we could in 12 days. We got the bass and drums and some guitars, but we were working primarily on just getting, getting that right. You know, I mean, I think, I, think, I think today we're not allowed to have that much time. <laughs> like you know, 12, 12 days to do, to get the bass and drums because we were exploring like everything. Like, Every little part of that song, you had like we had to think about like, okay, what what are we gonna do on that verse? What are we gonna do on that chorus? You know, and, and things. I, I guess when you get older, as as you get older, you, you get you get headier about things. You know, so we tried to keep our heads out of it and just kind of go with what felt right. Yeah, because the headiness is already there. Like it's yeah. already smart. You don't need to make yeah. it smarter. But but you know, Nier was very thoughtful. We would we would all just we would work on a work out a, a bunch of things in, in uh, sectionally. And then we just try to get it through from, you know, from top to bottom, you know, uh, and, and then I would just, if I needed to, I'd take little bits and pieces from other takes, you know, we'd, we'd probably do, I don't know, it, I, I can't remember, 10, 10 takes overall, you know, and without, without burning yourself out, I mean. During this process that you were working with John, was there any moment where you were like, oh, this guy's for real? Yes. I, I think yes. there's a future here. What was it? What was it about him? I mean, I think when I saw him down in Atlanta playing live, yeah, it. I, I just shook my head like I can't believe what I'm witnessing here. Why? I, was I mean, it his would, technical chops? Was it his yeah, singing? Yeah, his singing, but also his banter. He was so ridiculously funny in between so he's songs. A star. I mean, yeah. He was a total star. This was the age of like LimeWire and Napster. We yeah. all heard those too. Like, I, yeah. you know, we were kids growing up in Marin, and all those live recordings spread yeah. like wildfire. Yeah. I feel like this was one of the first things to blow up where we all heard those bootlegs before the EP came out. So we were kind of tracking his career like just the same way you were. We heard yeah. the live things and we heard the EP and then yeah. the record that you guys made. It was kind of like cool how it happened, very of the moment. Yeah, and also when I when I heard him play Neon, when I saw the, the chops, I was like, I mean, yeah. I was just floored at, at, at what, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you can play it. I, I, I try, but I can't, I'm not, no, I can't do that. That is a hard song to play. That was a song everyone was trying to figure out how to play in college. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I went, I went to Berkeley for a little bit, and you, you, I think John Mayer is one of the few people I know who have had such commercial success knowing the Berkeley, just all that theory, 
and he applies it. Yes. But he doesn't. He doesn't go overboard. Right. And it's and it's just he, he's just done it. So he, he's done it very tastefully. You can you can appreciate. I mean, melodically, harmonically, and lyrically, it's yeah. smart. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's smart on all three yeah. levels. But he was also a heartthrob. So like yeah. all the girls were going crazy. They didn't give a shit about that he was playing like the sharp eleven over the dominant right, two right, chord. Right, right, <laughs> right. They were right. just like he's this cute guy playing the guitar. Yeah. You know, they appreciate it. I don't know, man. I think they were like, oh my God, he's playing Lydian. I love that. <laughs> so for all the guys, for like the nerdy music kids that were into what he was doing, you know, from a craftsmanship point of view, they were also jealous of like, how is this guy, this guy's like cracking the code lyrically, structurally, and also getting all the girls. Yeah. We, we hated him for and, all these yeah. reasons. And the, the theory and, and the harmony that shows up, it shows up in a way actually that supports the heartthrob piece of it. It sounds heartthrobby, and I was joking about Lydian. The Lydian scale is super similar to the major scale, but with one note changed. The fourth is raised. So here's our C major scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, back to the octave. Here's our C Lydian scale, which has that fourth raised. If we're talking modes, it's the fourth mode. But also, there's that moment. Right, there's that descending. Yeah. yeah. Like thing that's just so sweet and nice. Yeah. And totally. it's, the, it's the jewel moment. Plus it's the, the Lydian jewel I mean, moment. the chorus. That's, that, that's great. That's bold, especially yeah. for this time. He wasn't playing the game. You know what I right. mean? He wasn't copying what was on the radio at the time. He was coming out as himself with really smart shit and, uh, and something that was new and making a bold statement. On the record itself, on the playing and the compositions, as you're recording this, when you started, you said, maybe we'll sell 100,000 records. That, that's in my mind. Yeah. When you finished the record, did you have a feeling that you were sitting on a hit? Or did I you thought, think? I thought it was. Fantastic, and Greg Latterman, who who signed, and and my friend Michael McDonald, who was managing, Michael Michael was being very even. Greg was, he said, dude, you have no idea. He said this thing is going to sell millions. He said this is going to be huge. And the thing is, you know, I've heard that a million times in my life. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, right. yeah, just settle down, settle down, people. It's not going to be crazy. And sure enough, I and mean, it just happened at the Grammys. I watched, I, I played with John on the tours, uh, leading up to his Grammys, and and I, I would see. You know the the build like it doubled and tripled every time we yeah, we go back. and 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 that'd be it was just amazing and then then they won that Grammy and yeah it was, it was definitely a shocker to see and crazy you know, no, no I don't think anyone none of us in in that whole circle thought it was going to go that quickly did you guys butt heads at all did you see things exactly the same way as you were making the record we were pretty I would I would really push him lyrically I mean not not I would push him vocally as much as I could because I thought How the vocal, so? What do, you, what do you mean? Push? I would have him do it over and over again. Really? And I, I I remember him looking at me like, I can't do it anymore. And that, that's fine. But I, I just I just felt like this Full was... Full takes? Uh, yeah. And sometimes, you know, we just do like little bits. He had, uh, he had allergies. Did you comp the vocal heavily? I did. Well, no. Some, some On some I did, some I didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, but we... Um, you know, auto tune wasn't really even a thing back then. He so we just not need it. We just... Yeah. We would just yeah. He was just saying he didn't really need it. You yeah. Know? So... Uh, it was just getting it right and, and not just over overdoing so you, it. You you were a stickler for details as I was. far as like let's get this this vocal perfect. Yeah, I mean and, and I was I was very much like I loved editing. I mean as soon as you know like I, I had a radar. I don't know if you guys ever saw the radar, but it was mm -hmm. a, a, it was basically right when Pro Tools was coming out. Yeah, it was, it was a little bit before, but you know. When all of a sudden you can look at things and, yeah. and fix things, you're, yeah. you're just you just dive yeah. in deep and you, you zoom in. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, totally. and so and so you know, <laughs> early days like all you want to do is make things really, really right. right. And, and we did make it really right. I mean, it sounds pristine. But Listening. they also but they played so beautifully. I mean, those guys like you know Nier and, and Dave Labriere, they were they were definitely tongue and groove. Had he played with them before? Mm. So this was the first time this band really played together. Yeah. Every once in a while, I'll listen to something I made a long time ago and think, oh, I wish I would have done that differently. Do you, are you like that? Do you listen to stuff? You oh, can? yeah. What sticks out to you is like interesting or strange or? I mean, this this all sounds good to me. Okay. I mean, I'm not, I, don't, nothing I don't really have do. any, I, nothing makes me grumpy. When yeah. I'm like, oh, and there's nothing cringeworthy in, in that one. Yeah. It's, it's just other artists that I'm like, oh, okay. what was I, what was I <laughs> thinking, you know? Like, yeah. But I feel that this, this was preserved. I mean, it was we we made it and 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 didn't mess it up really. Coming off of the Dave Matthews stuff, 
Can you compare like their two approaches artistically and uh, as singers, as songwriters? How was it like, what was it like working with those two kind of back to back? I mean, I was with Dave Matthews early. I mean, I still work with Dave. I've been work working with him for 30 years in, in some capacity as, you know, producer, mixer, co-conspirator, writer, whatever, yeah. uh, pre-production, pre just like just making little noises together. I think that coming up with Dave Matthews early days, it was the band, uh -huh. you know, and I, I did do a lot of work with Dave one-on-one, -on -one, but Dave had a band. John didn't have a band early days. So right. we basically, on Room for Squares, we just kind of made, the, you know, a couple of us who, who've, made that sound or right. made, made made the record what it was and then john kind of grew into a band you know uh -huh. over over the i guess by the third record especially he had he a ridiculous crew. band he had his crew, yeah you know so band versus individual right yes that makes sense what have you been listening to i mean you know i mean i'm a crazy lizzie mcalpine fan oh. i'm i'm just out of my mind for her and, and and i was just telling ryan earlier that John Mayer and I were texting a whole lot about like how what a insanely talented, wonderful artist she is. You know I bleed myself dry for you over and over again. Jack, what do you got? What you been listening to? There's a song called Forever Heavy by Black Moth Super Rainbow. Okay, so as we were preparing for another episode of this show, which is going to be the top, uh, our top five guitar sounds hmm. of all time, I was just listening to all this guitar music and, and came back to this record, uh, this Frizzell record. Uh, I think it's called This Land. <laughs> John, if you would, would you please sign for us our our diamond, our red diamond? Happily. Thank you guys so much for watching. This has been Dead Wax. Don't forget to comment, let us know what we should listen to next. Smash that like, subscribe. We'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>